Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled, What is Sustainable Design? ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Mr. Scott Lane. Mr. Lane serves as the Assistant Superintendent for Support Services for the Irving Independent School District located in Irving, Texas. While Mr. Lane's responsibilities are diverse, he has been instrumental in the design and construction of what is believed to be the first net zero middle school and the largest net zero public school in the country. Mr. Lane's additional duties include maintenance, environmental compliance, security, energy management, and school construction. Again, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Scott Lane. Thank you, Mr. Lane, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Thank you, Dr. Doris, for the introduction. I hope that the following information will be helpful in your endeavors towards sustainable planning, design, and construction. For the past two years, I have been involved in this process as a part of the Lady Bird Johnson Middle School Construction Project. It has been extremely worthwhile and gratifying to know that we are not only doing our part to improve and enhance our environment, but giving our children the opportunity to learn and experience sustainability as a part of their lifelong learning process. Today, I hope to accomplish four goals related to sustainability. The first goal would be to educate you on the advantages of utilizing the Earth's constant subsurface temperature in order to heat and cool a building. The second goal will be to educate you on the use of renewable energies, such as solar and wind, for the generation of electricity. The third goal emphasizes the use of sustainable building materials that will help the environment for future generations and immediately provide a healthier environment for building occupants. And the fourth goal is to educate you on the use of gray water, natural groundwater, and captured rainwater, all to be utilized for site irrigation. Let's begin with the first goal, that being to provide you with information pertaining to utilization of the Earth's constant subsurface temperature to heat and cool a building. In this particular application, we accomplish this through the use of geothermal heat pumps. When talking about the use of ground temperature, this is actually considered a renewable energy source. Even though we are not using the ground to produce energy, we utilize the ground to reduce the amount of energy needed. In terms of efficiency, a geothermal heat pump system will save 3 to 5 kilowatt hours by utilizing the Earth's subsurface for every 1 kilowatt hour that comes from the grid. The use of geothermal heat pumps saves up to 40% of energy costs compared to a standard 4-pipe system. Oftentimes, I indicate this particular application as energy reduction rather than energy production, but nevertheless, it is considered a renewable energy. How does this work? In simple terms, the ground temperature varies throughout the country due to variations in the climate. However, in all parts of the country, the ground temperature will remain constant year-round beginning at a specific depth. Related to our project, that depth occurs at 12 feet, and at that depth, the temperature remains at 70 degrees year-round. The system cools the building in in the summertime by rejecting heat into the earth. In the wintertime, the system takes heat from the earth and transfers it into the building. This is accomplished through a closed-loop water system that provides the initial extraction within the building and then is transferred to the ground through the use of the geo wells. In total, we have 530 geo wells on the site at a depth of 250 feet each. 
Even though the ground temperature is constant at 12 feet in depth, the wells must be 250 feet deep in order to allow for the necessary heat transfer to occur. Throughout the building, the piping from the wells are viewable, allowing students to see the temperature of the water leaving the building and the temperature of the water returning from the wells. Additionally, a heat pump is visible from within the building that allows students to learn about the refrigeration cycle, thus completing the entire heating and air conditioning system cycle. In addition to the visual system display mentioned above, the geothermal technology is on display at one of the four learning nodes located within the building. The Earth node focuses on this sustainable building feature and is designed as a tool to further educate students on sustainability and the science behind it. Additionally, live building data, dynamic data from other sources, and educational videos are displayed on the four monitors located at each node. Throughout the country, geothermal systems are gaining in popularity due to the significant reduction in energy use. The second objective or goal I would like to discuss pertains to real renewable energies. Renewable energies can be defined as energy that is created as a result of our natural environment. It is renewable because there is an endless source of power. The two types of systems that I will discuss will be solar and wind applications. Solar energy has been utilized for many, many years. Solar panels have been available for at least 50 years. If they have been so prevalent, then why haven't they been used? Well, in simple terms, it relates to money and technology. Up until recent years, solar panels were incredibly expensive to manufacture and the cost outweighed the benefit. In terms of life cycle costing, one must determine if the return on the investment, or the ROI, will be real within a reasonable amount of time. Until recently, the ROI on the solar panels could not even be realized throughout the lifetime of the panels, let alone in a reasonable payback time frame. Additionally, the efficiency of solar panels made it extremely difficult to utilize for specific sites. Inefficient panels, which is gauged by the amount of watts produced by each panel, created space issues. Frankly, there was not enough roof space to install solar panels to adequately power power a structure which would result in the need for more panels, which in turn cost more money and created a space utilization issue. Not only would panels have to be placed on the building's roof, but also on the ground and on other roof structures such as parking garages or canopies to meet the necessary building load. All of this resulted in more upfront costs for the installation of solar panels. With today's technology, solar panels are legitimate and real. Efficiencies have increased, thus resulting in less building area being needed for panel placement due to environmental issues and our government's initiative to become a more sustainable society. The demand for panels has risen, resulting in overall costs being reduced. In reality, today's costs for solar panels are at 10% of costs compared to 25 years ago. Because of cost and changing and better technology, solar has become a player in providing electricity to building sites. The solar panels provided for Lady Bird Johnson encompasses approximately 75% of the entire roof area. The panels measure 3 foot by 5 foot, with each panel producing 191 watts of electricity, resulting in a 600 kW array. There is approximately 64,000 square feet of solar panels. The solar can achieve such a high level of output due to their cylindrical configuration. Unlike typical solar panels, these rest approximately 10 inches above the roof deck and run parallel to the roof. There is a 4 to 6 inch air gap between each cylinder which allows the sunlight to reflect off of the roof providing daylight to the underside of the cylinders. 
The building is constructed with a solar panel observation deck, which is accessed by stairs off of the main hallway. The viewing area allows students to directly observe the solar arrays and is an opportune teaching space for faculty. The location of the stairs provides easy access to the deck for visitors and minimizes distractions to students while school is in session. The inverters, which convert the DC power from the solar panels to AC power, are located off of a secondary hallway. A viewing window into the inverter room allows students to observe the equipment that plays an important role in the energy producing capability of the building and of the solar panels. The inverters allow for solar produced power to be used immediately, then pulls additional power from the electric grid or sends excess power back to the grid based on the current building load. The solar panels generate approximately 40% of the power needs for the site. The wind turbines are another source of renewable energy for the site. Wind turbines are not that prevalent in the southern part of the country due to the minimal amount of wind. Turbines are controversial when it comes to their use in an urban environment. This is due to the amount of noise they generate when in full operation as well as their potential danger to birds. Due to noise limitations, we utilize the residential wind turbines for our site. There are a total of 12 turbines that are approximately 45 feet in height. Each turbine generates 2.4 kilowatts of power at the rated wind speed of 29 miles per hour. As mentioned, these generate minimal power, accounting for only 1% of the energy needs for the building. While probably not a good investment in terms of renewable energy, the turbines serve as a landmark to the site, meaning that visitors quickly realize the significance of the school as they approach the building. Additionally, the wind turbines serve as an educational tool for students. They are able to observe the turbines in action and record wind data to determine power generation. The wind technology is also on display as another one of the four learning nodes located within the building. The wind node focuses on this sustainable building feature and is designed as a tool to further educate students on sustainability and the science behind it. The node provides an active turbine in which the students have the ability to test their strength to produce wind and then realize how much power is generated through their manual efforts. Also, information is displayed regarding which areas of the country are most advantageous for wind-generated power. As with the solar display node, live building data, dynamic data from other sources, and educational videos are displayed on the four monitors located at each node. The third objective that we are trying to accomplish today is related to the use of sustainable materials and how it can not only help the environment but provide a healthier environment for building occupants. This is accomplished through the use of sustainable products and the use of equipment that creates a more sustainable environment. First, let's talk about some of the products that were utilized. Throughout the building, rubber flooring is used for classrooms, hallways, and the cafeteria. The flooring is made from 12% recycled material and is 100% recyclable. This flooring requires no finish and is cleaned with soap and water. This not only helps the environment by limiting the amount of volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, being emitted through the use of chemicals, but allows for significant cost savings in terms of chemicals and the custodial custodial labor that is not needed for finishing the floors. Additionally, the science classroom floors are finished with polished concrete, a highly sustainable material that requires no finished product similar to the rubber flooring. Cork tack boards are used throughout the building as well as low VOC paints. Carpet flooring is used in the library and main office area. The carpet utilizes a power bond backing made of 50% recycled materials. All building furniture is Green Guard certified, meaning it is made from recycled materials. One other sustainable product used is in the kitchen area where the countertops are made from recycled glass. High efficiency lighting applications throughout the building are other key sustainable features. Classrooms utilize two lamp 32 watt fluorescent T8 bulbs with suspended direct indirect linear high efficiency fixtures. 
All fixtures have dimming ballast to allow for reduced lighting power density without sacrificing lighting quality. Classrooms utilize vacancy sensors, which turn lights off when no one is in the room, but require the user to manually turn them on upon entering the room. Occupancy sensors are used in larger areas of the building, which allows for lighting to automatically turn on when individuals enter the space and automatically turn off when individuals vacate the space. Additionally, photocells are utilized to further reduce the artificial lighting levels when sufficient natural lighting is present. Each classroom can operate in four different lighting scenes that allow lighting levels to fluctuate between 10% and 60%. Classroom corridors use a 45-watt 2x2 LED type fixture. These fixtures are located on 12-foot centers and are rated to maintain 80% of their output at 50,000 hours. Student restrooms utilize 25-watt LED recessed can fixtures. The layout is one-for-one compared to the traditional 32-watt compact fluorescent. The primary benefit is the 50,000 hour rated lamp life compared to the 10 to 12,000 hours for compact fluorescence, which helps to reduce maintenance costs and the time associated with replacing the lamps. The gymnasiums are equipped with six lamp, 54 watt T5 high output 2x4 suspended fixtures. Each fixture includes dual ballast and is capable of operating with half or all of the lamps on. This, combined with lighting controls for each row of fixtures, allows the gymnasiums to operate at several lighting power levels ranging from UIL full power, which is 3.67 watts per square foot, down to as low as 0.52 watts per square foot. The final objective or goal that we will discuss relates to gray water applications and water conservation in general. Even though water is not considered an energy source, it is just important that we develop means to utilize the water provided within the natural environment to accommodate our site needs. The term gray water basically relates to recycled water. In simple terms, water is reused for very specific applications. Obviously, the amount of contamination plays a role as to what water can be reused. In most cases, this application is used for wastewater that occurs at sinks, drinking fountains, showers, and even washing machines. Simply put, rather than the used water being captured by the typical sewer piping, this water is piped to a cistern or storage tank and then reused for site irrigation. Due to its used content, this type of water is typically used for drip irrigation pertaining to landscaping. It is important that the water, since it is recycled, is not sprayed into the open air. Research has shown that when this type of application is used, there is the potential for Legionnaire's disease. Relative to our particular site, we utilize this gray water to drip irrigate all plants and shrubs within the landscaping areas. At some sites, gray water has been used to provide the water supply to restroom toilets. This is a good application, but creates a perception issue when used within schools present with children. If this application is used, building codes require that the water be colored so as to denote gray water and that signs be posted indicating the use of gray water. Even though a worthwhile application, we do not use this particular application in our schools. Another driving force in the use of gray water relates to expense. If utilized, building code requires that separate piping be provided to the service areas for gray water. In effect, this creates double piping to restrooms that will increase the cost of construction. Another source of water conservation is the capturing of rainwater. In the past, rainwater is usually drained into the storm system, which is then used to replenish lakes and ponds and other things. Rather than using this standard design, Ladybird Middle School has been designed so that all rainwater is captured at the site rather than going to the storm system. All of the rainwater is piped to a large underground storage tank and then used for drip irrigation for landscaping. Additionally, 
All condensate water that is produced by the heating and air conditioning system is captured and stored on site for drip irrigation. Again, all of these water sources allow us to properly maintain the landscaping for the site. The final source of water conservation is through the use of a water well. The site has a well that is approximately 1,900 feet in depth. This well provides an endless supply of fresh water, which is used to irrigate the entire site. Groundwater is the best type of water to use for site irrigation since it contains no chemicals such as chlorine. I am told it is even better than rainwater. Since there is an endless supply, city restrictions due to drought tolerances does not play a factor. On days when no one else can water, we can deliver fresh water to our site, keeping it at a high level of beautification. Before I conclude, I would like to spend just a few moments discussing the curriculum and instructional programs that were incorporated at Lady Bird Johnson Middle School in which they utilize and integrate the renewable energies that are present. The school uses a 21st century innovative hybrid project-based discovery model for their overall curricular framework. Unit plans are created blending reading content with history content and English content with science content. An example of this would be in a science English unit connecting a hero's journey of storytelling with a hero in science like Albert Einstein. Students are given real problems that can connect to their world so they can understand the concepts taught in our curriculum. In math classes, fantasy football is used to teach the first six weeks concepts. All math objectives can be used to calculate, solve, or project statistics from the NFL fantasy football website and iPad apps. We want every child to think learning is relevant so any real world connection we can use to apply learning is important and our highest priority. The school started the first five days using a project-based lesson in all content five areas to become better stewards of our building and planet. A message from the principal was sent to all students. In order to attend the first net zero middle school in the nation, all students must learn the following. How are we net zero and how is our energy consumption design different than another school? What percentage is created by wind and by the solar panels? Where is our energy grid system and how can you analyze the data to understand how to save and reduce energy used in the building? What is LEED Gold and how did Lady Bird Middle School get that rating from the U.S. Green Building Council? How will our pulper work and reduce trash at our local landfill? What are all the instructional pieces of the four museum exhibits in the hallway, wind, water, sun, and earth. Students learned all of the building pieces so they can connect their learning to the building and the overall purpose of the building design. All students recycle paper, aluminum, plastic, and are working to become an eco-green school receiving the Green Flag Award from the U.S. National Wildlife Federation. Now, let me talk a little bit about the technology. History classes and English classes are one-to-one -one with technology tools. History uses iPads in their classrooms. English uses netbooks, which are smaller laptops, in their classrooms. Paper is not submitted for grades. All students' work and documents are emailed to their teachers using student Google email accounts. Clouding programs like Google Apps and Project Share are set up so all work can be dropped into electronic drop boxes. All teacher lessons are posted on Project Share so students can complete work from home or any classroom using technology. Reading and science classes are two-to-one with technology tools. Students use either their interactive notebook or netbooks to complete all assignments. Interactive projectors are in every classroom, making the whiteboard an interactive board for students or teacher use. And finally, math classes use the new TI Interactive Graphic Calculators. 
In closing, I hope the provided information has increased your knowledge and awareness towards sustainable planning, design, and construction. Many worthwhile applications are taking place at Lady Bird Johnson Middle School, which is a reflection of what is transpiring throughout the world. Of all the many reasons to consider sustainability and the net zero concept, from the environment to the economy, the best reason of all is because it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled, What is Sustainable Design? We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding sustainable design of learning environments. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Scott Lane, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation at acefacilities.org. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.